I want to begin with a quote from the Catechism, which actually is a quote uh, from Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church. The Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. We must never uh, forget that as Catholic or Orthodox Christians. In Lumen Gentium, we hear also the other sacraments, indeed, all ecclesiastical ministries and works of the apostolate are bound up with the Eucharist and are orientated toward it. For in the blessed Eucharist is contained the whole spiritual good of the church, namely Christ himself, our Passion, Pasch, or Paschal Lamb would be a, a bit more modern translation. This quote is ag agonally from another document of the Second Vatican Council, Presbyter Presbyterorum Ordinis number five. Now, obviously, it's impossible to do justice to the Blessed Sacrament or to the Eucharist in one single talk. But I want to say why I'm speaking about this today and, and not about who knows what else. I had two experiences in the last, last few years that made me think it would be good that people uh, heard more about this. The first was a remark I heard that, I didn't hear him say this because I don't watch his program, but it's a remark that Bishop Robert Barron, who was then auxiliary uh, Bishop of Los Angeles, it's a remark that he said that, that 70% of American Catholics do not believe in the real presence, 70%. That kind of shocked me, but then I said, well, I don't know whether it's any different in some other countries. I don't want to say everywhere, but, but in other countries. And he referred to a study that was called the Pew Research Center. Well, this study came out of the Pew Research Center. And then I, you can all get all of these things downlined uh, today, downloaded. And so I looked at that, and I also saw that according to this survey, that 37% of those who do go to church on Sunday don't believe in the real presence. And that was more of a, of a, of a shock. And the latest uh, figures that I saw came from something called the Catholic News Agency, that 17% of American Catholics go to church on Sunday, 17%. It's about the same as it is in Austria. Now, the second experience, though, was the reading of a chapter in Pope Benedict's last published work, published afterwards, after he died, and he had insisted that it not be published before he died. And it came out in Italian, that's on your, the sheet that you have there. Uh, che cos'è il cristianesimo quasi un testamento spirituale? So, uh, what really is Christi uh, uh, Christianity? Uh, a sort of uh, te a spiritual testament. Now, at the same time, I ordered it a week after it came out. I ordered it in, in Kindle. I noticed that the German translation would be coming out in March. And I wanted to get it for a friend, but then I said, eh, I'll wait till, till March. You know, with Amazon, you can do that in advance, and then they'll send it to you when it's, when it's published. Well, the, the truth is, it never came out in German. It never came out in English. It never came out in Spanish. The only language that it ever was translated into was French. It was in, it's in French. Uh, it's also not in Polish. I checked there as well. And I want to say it's an explosive book. It treats a number of subjects, not just the Eucharist. Uh, explosive in this sense that it wouldn't make him very popular to say the things that he actually does say in this book. But I can recommend it to you. And as you know today, with translation problems, if you adjust things a bit, you can, you can get, if, you, if it's a chapter, you put it in a, a translation program like Deepo, and you have today a very good translation. 
In the past, with Google and so forth, it was kind of something you could laugh about. But today, it's a, it's a bit different. So you could read books. I, don't, I have to t tell you the truth. I never try to read a book in Japanese. But uh, maybe it works as well. So, so I'm deeply indebted to Pope Benedict then for some of the insights here, or, or perhaps many of the insights here. But I want to begin by talking about uh, frequent reception of Holy Communion and its history. Now, we're living in an age in which many countries, most Catholics who go to Mass, will go, or, or Divine Liturgy, will go then to Communion. I would say uh, it's unfortunate that most don't go to confession very often, but if you go to Mass, eh, you go to Communion. Everybody's going to Communion. It's a bit exaggerated, uh, and it's not necessarily the case in Poland, for example. And it wasn't the case in a parish where I was the parish priest for 15 years in Vienna. Uh, I remember very well a husband telling me a number of times he, if he had a big argument with his wife in the morning and then they went to Mass, he wouldn't go to communion. She wouldn't either. I respect that. I respect that. The opposite view is to say uh, the, the reception of Holy Communion is healing and you should go anyway unless you've committed mortal sin. You can argue both ways on that. Let's look at the history of the reception of Communion. According to the Acts of the Apostle 2.46, the faithful in Jerusalem received Communion every day. So in the very earliest stages of the church. And However, when St. Paul was in Troas, which would, when then in Asia Modern, Minor, today Turkey, the faithful met for the Eucharist only on the first day of the week. So Acts 26 to 11. And this practice is confirmed in the very early church document called the Didache from about, most people say, 90, uh, 100, something like that, as well as by Justin Martyr, uh, maybe 50 years later. So that was the practice. You know, the first day of the week on Sunday, people went to Mass and normally went to communion. By the time we get to the writings of St. Cyprian, this would be around 260, and also later than that, it's clear that Mass was be ce being celebrated every day and that daily reception of Holy Communion uh, was, was the norm, was, was the norm. Now, what happened after that, a century later, I cannot exactly explain. Some say it's the influence of Arianism and so on. But by the time of St. Ambrose and St. Augustine, and most especially St. John Chrysostom. So we're talking about then uh, the fourth century, St. John Chrysostom, usual date is 345, 407. He complains quite strongly about leaving the altar to distribute Holy Communion, standing there and nobody coming to communion. So that's the fourth century. In vain we stand before the altar, there is no one to partake partake. Now practices varied from place to place and I don't know if anyone has done a doctoral dissertation on, on this subject. So if you say well that's the way it was say in Constantinople or Antioch with, with uh, the bishops or in Rome it doesn't necessarily mean that it was in Ethiopia. We, we can't say that but those who have, have written about it, the fathers of the church, are witness to the fact that people just simply were not going. But we can say in some parts of the ancient world uh, that uh, people were communicating maybe once a week, maybe, I'm not sure. But with the breakup of the Roman Empire under Charlemagne, after, let's just say, after Charlemagne, this practice came to an end in most places, and even earlier in England, where, be the venerable complaints, nobody's going to communion. 
The Middle Ages, of course, are often referred to as the ages of faith. And there's good reason for that. It was also a time when adoration of the Blessed Sacrament uh, became uh, popular a little later in the Middle Ages than also uh, Corpus Christi, processions, and things like that. Uh, but it was necessary at the Fourth Lateran Council in the year 1215 to compel the faithful under pain of excommunication to receive at least once a year, under pain of excommunication. So that shows what the situation was. You don't have to do that if most people are going. There's always going to be people who do what they want. But that shows the seriousness of the matter. Now, in the order f formed by St. Clair and St. Francis, usually in English you say the poor Clares. So in the initial rule of the order, the sisters could go to communion six times a year, six times a year. The Dominicans, the Dominican sisters were more generous along those lines, but the third order of St. Dominic was only four times a year. And even great saints, where you didn't have to say, oh, well, maybe, you know, the sinners or, or there's something like this, received communion rather rarely. Say, St. Louis of France received six times a year. St. Elizabeth of Hungary and Turingen received only three times a year. That was the norm at the time. And what's interesting, I have yet to find a source from a significant theologian which supports not going to communion frequently. Depend on what you mean by frequently, but three times in a year I would not consider frequently, or six, six times either. So, St. Thomas Aquinas recommends it, St. Bonaventure, Peter Lombard, and many, many others. Not everybody writes about it, of course. But even though uh, some, some of the saints were successful in their lifetime in bringing sort of a revival so that people were going more often, St. Catherine, Catherine of Siena would be an example of that. It's kind of like petered out after, uh, after she died. The Council of Trent encouraged the practice of frequent communion at a couple of its sessions. And I quote here from session 22, that's out on your paper, chapter six, let not the faithful deem it enough to receive the body of the Lord once a year only, but let them judge that communion ought to be more frequent. But whether it is more expedient that it should be monthly, weekly, or daily, can be decided by no fixed universal rule. Now, it was the Council of Trent that revised the Roman liturgy and actually gathered uh, different liturgies together to create what we call today the Tridentine Mass. And one of the things that was introduced at the time was in a Eucharistic liturgy in one of the countries, and that was the words which we say today, also at, in the Novus Ordo, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter unto my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. At the same time, the confidier, which had been said at the beginning of the Mass, was then repeated before people uh, went to communion. So, that was what was introduced at the time. Uh, very likely some Catholics didn't feel worthy of going, and so it gave, the, just saying these words, Lord, I am not worthy an admission of that, and still overcoming that and going was very um, important. Certainly in the Middle Ages itself, the severe penances that were uh, imposed on people who went to confession or didn't go to confession, uh, encouraged this tendency to feel unworthy, you know, that you fall back into the same sins. Now, in the Middle Ages, if you went to uh, confession in the year, let's say, 1000, you didn't just get a father, uh, an Our Father and three Hail Marys. You didn't get that. You got, you got a number of things like fasting for three weeks or something like this. Although, you didn't say that you had committed adultery three times or something like that. 
So uh, this is certainly was a, was a factor there. Now, Pope Pius X, who was often called the great Pope of the Eucharist, the beginning of the uh, 20th century, uh, he acknowledged that he, he supported this confidier uh, before communion uh, so that people could acknowledge that they weren't worthy, but they would still feel that they could go, that they could depend upon God's uh, mercy. Now, for married couples, there was another factor involved here. For many centuries, it was thought by a good number of people that you should not go to Holy Communion on the day or the night after having marital relations. And the fathers of the church, this is my opinion, gave rather unhelpful advice in this matter. So uh, St. Augustine writes that there are good arguments to receive and good arguments not to receive. Now for simple people, that's not a good answer. That's not a good answer. The, uh, and he wasn't the only one. St. Jerome said exactly the same thing. In commenting on the subject of married clergy, St. Ambrose recalls that in Old Testament times, even lay people were obliged to observe countenance on the days leading to a sacrifice. As far as I can determine, there is no such prohibitions in effect for married couples at the present time, except, except for married clergy, of Orthodox churches and married, uh, married clergy of Greek Catholic uh, churches or rites, as well for Orthodox churches of married couples. That's still on the books. Now don't ask me if it's observed or not. I don't really know that. But And in the Coptic Orthodox Church, women who are, are also not permitted to receive communion when they are menstruating. In the Ethiopia Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopic Orthodox Church, they can't even enter the church. They have to stand outside. So a number of the things certainly discouraged people from, uh, from, from going regularly to, uh, to Holy Communion. There's no question that there were many attempts made by saints and founders of religious orders to encourage frequent communion, especially, for example, with the spread of the devotion uh, to the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, many faithful went more often to Holy Communion. And there were churches that introduced a Communion Sunday, so say the first Sunday of the month. Uh, you know, there were confessions f for a long time the day before, and then people went. But here, uh, because I'm in speaking to here, students at the ITI, I think I want to mention the experience of St. Therese in this respect because it's very, very telling. St. Therese had a great devotion to the Holy Eucharist. And the rule at that time was that one had to be 10 years of age before the preceding January 1st to be admitted to First Communion. She was unfortunately born on the second. She was born on the second and had to wait until she was 11 years of age. That's simply the way it was. But she had a great longing for the Blessed Sacrament, to receive the Blessed Sacrament from at least the age of seven, maybe, maybe even earlier, but at least the age of seven. Before the decree of Pope Pius X, Pope St. Pius X on frequent communion, it was the layperson's confessor who regulated how often the person went to communion. So you talk to your uh, confessor about that or your pastoral, the one who was guiding you, your director, and they said that. They said what was there. Now she was permitted, as she was a layperson, uh, to go four or five times a week. That was a rare permission at the time, a rare permission at a time, uh, but was also granted to her father, was also granted to her father, uh, perhaps not quite so often. Now, when she entered 
the Carmelite convent in 1888, she experienced a period of spiritual darkness right away, or, or dryness, you could also say. And certainly a contributing factor was that she no longer had the consolation of frequent communion. The prioress of the monastery, of the convent, Mother Maria de Gonzaga, was against frequent communion and sometimes used the reception of communion as a reward for a sister doing a specific difficult task. We're told that by Teresa's sister, who was also in the same convent, Pauline, who was her substitute mother after Teresa's mother died at such an early age. Her sister Marie, who also was in the convent with her, her sister Marie says that Teresa's main source, or her main source of suffering in all of these nine and a half years in the convent, in all of these years, was not the fact that there were periods where you know, she, she was, was just dry, she didn't know that God exists and, and, and so on, but rather was the deprivation of Holy Communion. Teresa prayed to St. Joseph in this matter and saw her prayers answered in a decree from Pope Leo XIII in 1891, which transferred, transferred the regulation of frequency of communion when you're in the convent or monastery from the religious superior to the confessor. Of course, this is the way it was for lay people anyway. This did not unfortunately resolve the matter because the chaplain for the convent at the time, uh, Louis August Jouf, was not in particular good, particularly in good health, and he could not or didn't have the strength or backbone, you can explain it in different ways, to oppose the mighty prioress Marie Gonzaga. To make a long story short, the only time that Teresa received daily communion, or almost daily communion, in nine and a half years of her religious life was during an outbreak of influenza in the convent, a period of time when the prioress was confined to bed in the convent, in the infirmary. It's the only time. And as soon as she got better, she took away all of the permission to go to communion. Shortly before she died, Teresa told the prioress, Mother, when I go to heaven, I will make you change your mind. On the 30th of September, Teresa died. A week later after she died, the chaplain to the convent, Père Youf, died. And the new chaplain who came in, Père Zachary Jules Ordien, at his very, very first instruction to the sisters, took at his text, the words, come and eat my bread, from Proverbs 9, 5. Trace's sister Marie notes, it was an invitation to daily communion. And he made it without anyone of the convent telling him about this desire of ours. Beautiful story. The generous efforts of Pope Pius X took many years to see concrete results. It even made it possible if you went to communion five times a week that you got a plenary indulgence without going to confession, without. I wouldn't say never going to confession, but the usual plenary indulgence now is a certain period of time, a week afterwards, sometimes 10 days, but not more than that. But he did that, he did everything he possibly could. And he called Pope, uh, Pope Pius X the reception of Holy Communion as the shortest and safest way to go to heaven. And he also lowered the age for communion to the age of reason. But perhaps the time was not ripe for the faithful to go as often as possible. And the reason would be, first of all, World War, Ta World War I came uh, Pope Pius died in uh, 1914. The war broke out. After the war was a very difficult period, so many nations had been changed uh, and, and, and so on. And now 
Uh, it was so. Uh, or, and then there was a time of recession, Second World War, and, and, and so forth. But anyway, uh, we should also say the birth of communism, for example. So all of these played a role why the church was perhaps not able to, to really fulfill what Pius X really wanted and had, 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 had promised uh, the faithful. Another factor that I haven't yet mentioned was the Eucharistic fast. For the Roman Rite, the Code of Canon Law, 1917, mandated a Eucharistic fast from midnight until the reception of Holy Communion. Now that required abstention from both food and liquids, including water. You could not take anything if you're going to communion. Now that was not so difficult if you went to mass early in the morning. Now if you went to eight o'clock mass, and uh, you, it was, was possible, it was possible. The regulation was interpreted to include everyone regardless of how old they were, although if you read it carefully in canon law of that time, it was required for those between the age of 21 and 60. But as I say, it was so interpreted that it, it meant also children which is a little bit more difficult than adults to fast. If you did not keep this fast, you were not allowed to receive communion except in danger of death. In danger of death, so strict it was. It was only in 1953 that Pope Pius XII provided a dispensation in which the sick, the sick could take liquids at any time which remains in effect naturally to today. Now, before I made my first Holy Communion here, this is sort of like an open confession. Before I made my first Holy Communion at the age of six, I deliberately on that day drank water. And I went to my mother and I told her, well, I can't go to communion then. I won't tell you what she said. So. And he also said, we're not going to even tell the priest about it. So, you know, you get nervous. Six years of age, yeah, that's what it was. Now, another thing that plays a role in, in all of this that you should keep in mind in other remarks that I say after this is that in the Roman Rite, and I want to stress that, in the Roman Rite, it had not been customary for centuries to receive communion within the Mass itself. You didn't receive communion within the Mass itself at the, as we did this evening. This was not done. This was simply not done. What happened is after Mass, the priest went into the sacristy, took off his mass, mass vestment, put on a surplice, came out again and stole, and distributed communion then to the people who came uh, to the to the altar rail after a um, confidior was said and a Lord I am not worthy. It was thought all of this time that you needed time to adore the blessed sacrament and there was no time within the mass to do that. Now I have to say that once again Pope Pius X encouraged the reception of Holy Communion within the, within the mass of the Roman Rite but it was a long time before it became a practice, sooner in some countries than in others. Pope Benedict mentions this in his youth in the 1930s. There were a number of people who were changing, that were trying to change that practice, part of the liturgical renewal, but the possibility of receiving communion within the Mass itself didn't come the, didn't become the norm in Bavaria until after World War II in the late 40s. So we're not talking about hundreds of years ago, so you just simply didn't have that opportunity. Now having finished this, I would say, historical review of the frequency of receiving Holy Communion, which also forms a basis for any remarks on intercommunion, I want to turn to the question of is the celebration of the Eucharist the Lord's Supper? Is the celebration of the Eucharist the Lord's Supper? And the answer is 
not so simple. The expression in English, the Lord's Supper, is the usual way Protestants describe their communion service. Not all, but most of them use that. I take it actually that the use of the term in the Catechism in 1329 is unfortunate, but it doesn't take into account the association by using that term. And it must be clear to us that St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 11.20 precisely, he uses precisely that term when he asks, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that is it not the Lord's Supper that you eat? The question, of course, is what is meant by that term? What is meant by that term? And that can lead to a thorny theological debate using words such as transubstantiation and consubstantiation. I'll mention some of that later. In general, we can say, except for high church Anglicans, it would be an exception to find a Protestant church where the Lord's Supper is celebrated every Sunday. Though there seems to be a trend in this direction in a few churches. In fact, you'll find a number of Protestant churches that celebrate the Lord's Supper, also called Holy Communion, only on Good Friday. It's not rare to find that. The distinction between the Lord's Supper and the Eucharist became pl blurred by the very, very heavy emphasis on the Eucharist as meal in the reforms to the Holy Mass initiated after Second Vatican Council. During the Council itself, the Council itself had a number of Protestant observers, and one of them was a well-known Protestant theologian, Edmund Schlink whose speech was well quoted at the council. He said that he, in the Catholic celebration of the Eucharist, meaning actually the Tridentine Mass, could not recognize the Lord's institution at the Last Supper. He said, God doesn't recognize that. Of course, the words would be said, you don't, you don't hear them, but, and he knew that, but he said he didn't recognize it. He maintained that the Catholic Mass, the Roman Rite, as it was then celebrated, bore no resemblance to Jesus' Lord's, to, to Jesus' Supper, or Lord's Supper. And Schlink was convinced that Martin Luther, by returning to the pure structure of the Supper, had overcome Catholic falsification. Now that was heard by many of the liturgists at the time and also by liturgists that formed the commission. And we can see some of the changes as what are we gonna do about that? And one of the first things was then the introduction of an altar facing the people, looking like a table. There were a lot of other changes introduced as well. But here I wanna be careful about what I say because you'll see on the internet the claim that six Protestant ministers helped to form or revise the Mass, the Tridentine Mass, at, to create the Novus Ordo Mass, and that the head of the commission, the Bishop Anibale Bunini, was a fri Freemason. I don't know, you know, these are, for me, not what you call airtight arguments. Bishop Bugnini may not have been a very pleasant person, that's witnessed by people at the time, but he was not the devil incarnate, so that should also be clear. Let us return to the argument often heard by Protestants that the early church was eager to, separate, to celebrate the Lord's Supper and therefore commemorate the Last Supper of our Lord with his apostles. Now, if so, you'd have to ask the question, the Last Supper, we're celebrating the Last Supper. Why are we celebrating the Last su Supper at eight o'clock in the morning or nine o'clock in the morning? Did that ever, ever occur to, to someone? That alone shows the practice of the church. You know, we should have had it, if it were, if it were true that it's the Lord's Supper, then we should celebrate it at the time most people have their evening meal. 
The truth is that the early church celebrated the Eucharist as an encounter with the risen Lord at Easter, not with Jesus at the Last Supper, and that's very important. Only in the encounter with the risen Lord in the morning of the first day of the week is the institution of the Eucharist complete, not before that. For only with the living, risen Christ can the sacred mysteries be celebrated, only. And that means the Eucharist is not, and you can underline that, it's not a memorial or reenactment of the Lord's Supper. As is stated in the Catechism, the Eucharist makes present the one sacrifice of Christ. In the letter to the Hebrews 9.12, we read that Jesus Christ entered once for all into the sanctuary with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The historical sacrifice of Christ is not repeated, but instead the sacrifice of the Mass is a memorial in which Christ's sacrifice is sacramentally present. Now, whether the Last Supper was a Passover meal, as presented as such in the Synoptics, or not, as presented in St. John's, it is clearly placed within the tradition of the Passover meal, such in the tradition of Pesach. It's closely associated with family, of home, membership in the people of Israel. And Jesus celebrated Pesach with those who had become his new family. He thus fulfills a precept of the time where pilgrims went up to Jerusalem to celebrate, done usually three times a year. They would join in companies, the so-called chavorot. And Christians then continued this tradition. Christian, the early Christian church was like a new Chavura of pilgrims who traveled with Jesus through his journey, through their journey, through life. Celebrating the Eucharist in the early church was from the very beginning connected with a community of believers and also with that to strict conditions of access. So in the Byzantine rite, community catechumens depart. That, of course, was in all of the early rites of the church. It was not open to everyone, this chavura. Now, I know we live in a time where popular slogans of open church and closed church are used to describe something, but it doesn't seem to correspond to the tradition of the church. It has everything to do, the celebration of the Eucharist, with the profound becoming of the church through Jesus Christ, through the risen Lord, as one body and one Lord, so that the church, that's we, can bring his life, Jesus' life, and light into the world. Returning again to the Last Supper and Jesus' institution of the Eucharist, it's important to note from a Catholic perspective that when the Lord said, do this in memory of me, he did not intend to invite his disciples to repeat the Last Supper. What was, what is meant, is to repeat the new offering of Jesus through his death on the cross and resurrection. And therefore, I knew overall form had to be found or developed in the life of the early church. It seems to me that many Catholic liturgists in the 20th century missed this point in trying to deduce the form of the Eucharist as a whole from the institution in the context of a Passover supper. We see about the year 155 in the writings of St. Justin Martyr, that the new form consisted of two basic components. 
they encounter the Word of God and what we call the Liturgy of the Word and the Eucharist. Now in internet, you'll find the explanation that the Greek word oikorestia is a translation of the Hebrew bracha. But it seems to me that as with much information and internet, that is incorrect. Bracha is blessing, could also be translated as praise, but rather it is thanksgiving. Eucharistia is thanksgiving, hodia. In the text on the Last Supper, we are told that Jesus gives thanks with the prayer of blessing. The Eucharist, together with the offerings of bread and wine, is to be considered the core of what we do when we celebrate Mass. So once again, the Eucharist, Eucharistic prayer, together with the offerings of bread and wine, is the core of what we do and celebrate Mass. The liturgy of the word prepares us for that core. In the classic Protestant interpretations of the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist is solely a meal, a holy meal. Let's just be fair, it's a holy meal. The holy offering is distributed and given to eat and drink. Whereas for Catholics in the Eucharist, the whole process of Christ's gift in his death and resurrection is present. Let me say that again. The whole process of God's gift in his death and resurrection is present. Body and blood are not things that can be distributed. It is the person of Jesus Christ who is offered. And that's also why for Catholics, participation in the Eucharist always has value even when Catholics, for whatever reason, cannot or do not want to eat the Holy Offering by receiving communion. Whereas for a a Protestant perspective, it's rather meaningless. You're going to a supper and you're not eating. So this is one of the conflicts between Catholics and Protestants. And it's also one of the reasons for Protestants' insistence on intercommunion for all who come to the Lord's Supper, to the Eucharist. For a Catholic, even without receiving Holy Communion, he or she takes part in the gift of Christ who is present in the sacrament. The Eucharist remains for the Catholic always an encounter with the crucified and risen Lord regardless of whether that person receives or not. The consecration is, of course, necessary in order to transform the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. It's also necessary to complete the sacrifice. That's why a priest must partake of the offerings. But it is not absolutely necessary. It's desirable, but it's not necessary that everyone present go to communion. We should not forget, however, that the Eucharist is also our sacrifice. And you say that uh, during the offertory. I forget exactly the words, but something like my sacrifice and yours, and it is so along these lines. I want to express, this is expressed very nicely in a document from, uh, from a church Uh, about the Eucharist as sacrifice. I'll read it to you. The Eucharist is a real sacrifice. It is Christ's once for all loving sacrifice for us. It is also our sacrifice, the loving surrender of our wills and our lives to God. When we receive Holy Communion, we are strengthened by Christ's real presence so that we can do the Father's will. The Mass, which perpetuates the unbloody sacrifice of Christ, strengthens us to live the sacrifices which the Christian life demands. We shouldn't forget that when we speak of Sunday obligation, we are only talking about being present at the Eucharist participating 
mind, soul, and body, the gestures we make, standing, sitting, and bowing, and making signs of the cross, that's fully participating in the Mass, whether you receive communion or not. In Eucharistic uh, prayer number, number four, we ask specifically that God's people may truly become a living sacrifice in Christ. That's worth the meditation. We pray that we may truly become a living sacrifice in Christ. And to this very day, according to church law, the obligation to receive communion applies to once a year in the now extended Easter season. Now, of course, if you're not going to receive, then the ancient practice of spiritual communion is recommended. St. Thomas Aquinas in the Summa Theologica 3, question 80, article 1, writes, there are two ways to receive Holy Communion. The preeminent way is to receive the body and blood of our Lord during the sacrifice of the Mass. But then he writes about the spiritual reception of the Blessed Sacrament by which one receives the effect of this sacrament, whereby a man is spiritually united with Christ through faith and charity. The effect of the sacrament can be secured by every person if he receives it in desire, though not in reality. So the effect of the sacrament can be secured by every person if he receives it in desire, though not in reality. So for whatever reason. Let's now return to the offering itself, which occurs through the transformation of the bread and wine into the real body and, Christ, body and blood of Jesus Christ. We speak as Catholics about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. For the reformer, Ulrich Zwingli, the Eucharist was a memorial. A holy memorial, but a memorial. Whereas John Calvin speaks of the dynamic presence and spiritual presence. He says Christ's body, his physical body, is in heaven, therefore we cannot receive it. And therefore, the bread and wine cannot become his body and blood. But his spirit is here, and that's what you receive. Now, for Anglicans, there's a whole wide range of beliefs. That's anybody who knows the Anglican Church even slightly knows that, that the, the code, what you believe and also your practices, is a very, very big range. In Article 28 of the 39 Articles of Faith, which you have to subscribe to, especially if you're uh, a pastor, we read the following. So Article 28. Transubstantiation, transubstantiation in the Supper of the Lord cannot be proved by holy writ, but is repugnant to the plain words of Scripture, overthroweth the nature of a sacrament, and hath given occasions to many superstitions. Now, the dominant Anglican position is called receptionism. receptionism. Not that there is an objective transformation at the altar, which is what we believe, but that the transformation is dependent on the faith of the recipient. That's what that means, receptionism. So uh, you wouldn't have to worry, for example, I mean, it's not very nice to think about, but uh, uh, the host falls on the floor and somebody who brought a dog, the dog comes and eats it. There's no question. You don't have to worry about it. It's not the body of Christ anyway if the dog has it. The dog has no faith. Some would dispute that in Vienna, but that's beside the point. Now, we, we should acknowledge that Martin Luther, unlike Swingley and Calvin, defended the real presence. In fact, in a dispute with the Reformers, he said he would prefer to accept all the horrors of the papacy rather than get together with the disputants of the real presence. Now, I don't know if he held that position to his death. That I don't know. 
what he understood under real presence, what Martin Luther understood under real presence, was, however, not the same as what Catholics and Orthodox understand, which is expressed in the word transubstantiation. Meto usiose. It's also on your sheet. Luther rejected the metaphysical formula in favor of consubstantiation, though I'm not sure that he really liked the word. Bread and wine are still present, but together with them, Christ is present in, with, and under the offerings, to be precise and quote what he says. The offerings then, bread and wine, are not transformed but the presence of Christ is added to them. A presence that is temporary and is limited then to the Lord's Supper itself. After the celebration, the remains of the offering, so if there was bread and, and wine still left over, then return to a profane use. They need not be kept as holy bread, but are usable, or, or wine, uh, in daily life as before. So that's why, uh, you know, in a Lutheran church, uh, you're not going to find a tabernacle. In some Anglican churches, yes, high Anglican, but they won't find it because there's no belief that uh, anything that's put in the tabernacle after the Lord's Supper is finished is the body and blood of Christ. This understanding of the Eucharist corresponds to a profound difference between Protestants and Catholics, or also Orthodox, of the Christian person. And it's expressed in the famous formula, simul justus et peccator, so both just and a sinner. Then, for the Lutheran tradition, becoming a Christian does not change man, transform man, but only adds something else to him. Whereas the Catholic faith teaches that becoming a Christian transforms the human being into a new creation. Now, it remains true in Catholic teaching that we are all sinners, but it's a fundamental change. It's still a transformation. Now, there's, you could say a lot about this point here. It's a big subject for which there's not time in this lecture. It's necessary also to stress that for Luther, the concept of the cross, or better, Christ crucified, is not present. But that only in the bread and wine, the body of and blood of Christ are mystically eaten. That's an important point. For Luther and Protestants in general, sacrifice, the concept of sacrifice is a reality that belongs to the law, to the Torah. Luther writes the law in the law, so could also say the Mosaic law, the Old Testament, God acts sub contrario, as an adversary to himself. The Mosaic law, law is anti-divine, which was also the position of an earlier reformer, namely Marcion. The Old Testament and New Testament, or the law and the gospel, you could also say, are in contradiction. Whereas the Catholic Church teaches that they are in correlation. The whole Bible, Old and New Testament, forms a unity because the whole Bible is the word of God. Now the concept of transubstantiation deserves certainly more place than I'm giving it here. A short version would be to say that the substance of bread and wine, the substance has been removed and replaced by another while the accidents of bread and wine remain. Now these terms are Aristotelian, 
accident, and substance. And the philosophical category of substance in modern philosophy has changed. And possibly, if somebody today was working on the subject of transubstantiation, he would express that in a different way. But I would say for us here tonight, what's important is the understanding of the Eucharist as sacrifice. What do we receive in the Eucharist? We allow ourselves to be taken up by the Lord Jesus Christ and are inserted into the new world of the resurrection. Most of us haven't really thought about that. Christ opens for us the door to the Father and therefore, or thereby, redeems us. The Eucharist is not a dinner get-together of Christians after the resurrection in which we eat a little of Christ's body and drink a little of his blood. It is a making present every time it's celebrated of the living Christ as a participation in his death and resurrection. It's a making present of the sacrifice of the cross. Luther, and not only Luther, condemned this in the harshest way on the basis of his rejection of the concept of sacrifice. Another difference between the Catholic and Lutheran positions can be seen when we ask the question, who may preside over the Eucharist? Who may preside over the Eucharistic celebration? According to the Lutheran tradition, any Christian may preside and often does. For good order in the church, there are professional pastors, Lutheran pastors, but they're not strictly necessary. For the Catholic and Orthodox traditions, the person who presides at the Eucharist, who recites the words at the consecration, who recites the words of transfiguration, is linked to priestly ordination. And the priestly ordination, according to the Catholic Church, also Orthodox Church, churches, priestly ordination involves an ontological and permanent change, even if the priest is laicized, as they say, afterwards. The arguments for women priests cannot be based on the fact that Protestants have women priests, pastors, and bishops. For ordination, as understood by the Catholic Church, by the Orthodox Church, is an ontological difference then. The priesthood of all believers is something that we all share at baptism, but that's only one part of the picture. There's also the ordained clergy. I must say that there's a lot of what I would call fuzzy thinking going on in the Catholic Church at the present time about the difference between the common priesthood and the ordained priesthood. Now with all of these differences, it should be clear that intercommunion between Catholics and Protestants is very problematic because we don't share the same concept of what the Eucharist is, both communion or the Lord's Supper. Now there are exceptions to this that are supposed to be made on the basis of a non-Catholic having the Catholic faith in the Eucharist. There are exceptions that are made. There have been examples. Uh, the great founder of, of uh, Thézé, uh, Frère Roger, uh, received communion from uh, Cardinal Ratzinger at the funeral of uh, Pope uh, uh, John Paul II. But I must, must also say that um, Frere Roger had the Catholic understanding of, of, the, of the Eucharist in full. He went to, he went to Mass and, and Communion in Tese every day. And when he was in Rome, I know priests in this area who saw him then in the Adoration Chapel. So 
you know, th there's always exceptions that you have to be careful about, but that's not a general rule. It's not a general rule that you can set. Now, the issue is a sensitive one, but it should not be handled intercommunion by denying our own belief in the Eucharist so that we have communion open to all. We need to respectfully explain what we as Catholics believe about the Eucharist. For the Eucharist is indeed the source and summit of Christian life. Amen. Thank you.